camera on. Okay, we'll call this meeting to order at 7 o'clock. First off, adoption of the agenda. Any questions, errors? If not, if I can get a motion. Mike? All in favor? Very. Regular meeting, July 15th, 2019. Any questions? Nope. I'll make a motion to adopt the minutes for July 15th as presented. All in favor? Carry. Okay, we'll move right into delegations. Our first uh, delegation is uh, Roger Reed, our MLA for the area. Roger, we'd like to welcome you and uh, see what you got to say. <laughs> see what I, I'm going to shock you all. Oh, I don't have much to say. Oh. So. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for one of the shortest drives of the last three months. That's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Um, but I want to say thank to each of you for uh, representing uh, on the town council. Now that I'm kind of in the midst of the fray and understand a little bit better, I want to just commend you each for, uh, for what you do as members of this council representing uh, the town of Clairsome and, and making the decisions that you make. So thank you for that. Um, and I want to add that it is an absolute privilege to represent communities like Clairsome and Edmonton. Um, and I've tried to, already in 100 days, try to be a strong, strong voice for the riding and for our communities. And um, I think I'm getting known for that up in Edmonton. Um, I'm happy to say that we're 100 days in, and I think we're off to a good start. As a government, we have uh, managed to uh, keep 55 of our 375 election promises of our platform already in the first 100 days, including things like uh, eliminating a carbon tax, which means immediate savings for communities and businesses and Albertans across the board. Um, the other part that I'm really excited about, and again a part of tonight, is uh, the engagement of our government in consultation with Albertans. I was privileged to spend uh, three days in the Crow's Nest Pass and Pincher Creek with the Minister of Environment and Parks a couple weeks ago. Uh, first of all, to convince him that he lives in the second most beautiful riding in the province. <laughs> um, but right. secondly, to spend time with, uh, with, with residents down here and, and to really take time to listen to their concerns. And I'm happy to say that uh, I find all of our ministers are in that capacity. They're really excited to listen to Albertans. Um, we're involved in consultations around red tape production with the Associate Minister of Red Tape Production, Grant Hunter. Uh, through our one-on-one -on -one small group and online consultations. We also have undertaken a, a huge consultation on Alberta Health Services. Uh, we're already seeing a number of, of messages come in in terms of, of how we, uh, we work with Alberta Health Services to improve care for Albertans. Um, I'm excited that in two weeks we have the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry here in Clairesome to do our Farm Freedom and Safety Act consultations. Um, been a very busy summer for him because he is also a farmer. So after seven weeks in Edmonton, getting home, checking his crops, and then being on the road to meet with farmers and ranchers across the province, uh, with harvest looming in the next week to 10 days, I'm still continuing those consultations, but we've had a great response from Albertans and ongoing consultations in agriculture and business and economic development. And uh, um, I think one of the greatest things this government brings forward is really the uh, that desire to sit down and listen to the concerns and the solutions that Albertans have for us. And, and uh, so it's, it's a privilege to be part of that. And I think in relationship to that, um, I don't think it's any secret around this table, but uh, I'm here to listen. Um, it's a privilege to sit with my local council that represents me and my community, um, but now to be able to in turn uh, make myself available to you as a council um, to listen to your concerns. Uh, I have had many opportunities to meet with ministers in Edmonton. Um, about communities, schools, individual concerns, and uh, have always been able to get meetings with ministers and their staff to do that. And uh, I think that will continue for the next four years. So with that being said, um, I want to take some time to listen, uh, hear about where you guys are, but halfway through your mandate, um, you know, uh, some of the things that you're anticipating from our government, some of the concerns that you may have, uh, some of the hopes that you may have, and uh, where I can be of assistance to you as a local council. Well, sounded pretty good. Sounds good. <laughs> Wasn't too long-winded. I'm, I'm only 100 days in. Oh, you're yeah. Give me four years. years. <laughs> well, what do you guys got? Any questions? I got nothing right off the top of my head. My, my first one is, um, where are we going with the MSI? Uh, so just within the last couple of days, um, Mr. Madhu announced that funding is, is announced and open before the... Um, 
uh, before the budget comes in November. So continue to put your applications in, allow you to go ahead and, and uh, work through this year. We will complete that with uh, the budget presentation in November. Uh, MSI has been a hot topic um, mm -hmm. in Cabinet, uh, and we go back to when we were running the election. Uh, again, with a number of us that are business people now in government, we understand the need for long-term, predictive, sustainable funding for communities. And so that's a high priority for us as a government. Uh, and again, I think the work that Mr. Madhu and his agency will do in terms of engaging uh, with MDs and communities to find the best way to accommodate that. Uh, you know, our priority, of course, has been economic development, getting, getting the economy back on track and getting Albertans back to work generating revenue so that we can look after things like schools and roads and health care <coughs> and infrastructure in uh, uh, in our communities, especially out here in rural Alberta where we are all kind of in the same boat with aging infrastructures <coughs> and pieces like that. Uh, so to be able to make sure those those fundings are there beyond the mandates of, of a four-year election, but we can have some long-term planning in place so that, that we we tackle that properly. I don't suppose there are any numbers attached to what you're saying. Uh, no, you think there's, <laughs> what I'm asking is, do you see any uh, reduction in the MSI or, or an increase? Because due, due to inflation and, as yes. like you mentioned, the weakening infrastructure. I, I can't answer the reduction or, um, the, or the increase piece at this point. We, of course, have the, the blue ribbon panel that we will receive a report on this week to really give us some. Uh, a forensic background on where pr provincial finances are at. Um, we believe it's really important for us to know those pieces so that we can sit down with municipalities and, and present true numbers. Uh, easier to, to make decisions based on real numbers than what we hope for or what we might have. Uh, so whether increases are or not are there. Um, I do have some numbers including where we're looking this fall. Um, so we have 597 million that's available under MSI uh, this year. Uh, we'll, of course, review that and present that growth or that decline mm -hmm. come next spring's budget. But for the remainder of this year, looking to this year, we've got five, almost $600 million yeah. that's available so, in MSI. So there's a good, a good draw there. Yep. Well, that's nice to know. That at least we have the sustainability for this, uh, for this fiscal year. Well, and, and I think beyond this year, we really want to make sure <clears throat> that, that the numbers we put together, again, allow you to do the long-term planning. Um, Claire's home and a lot of other rural communities are looking at those those pieces that will will grow uh, and expand their economies. Um, I know about the you know we've got our annexation here. We've got uh, some potential growth in the Crow's Nest Pass, Pincher Creek. I mean, all of my communities in in this riding, the same boat. They're they're poised to do some growth, but we need to be able to invest some capital to that yeah. to do that. Uh, and again, we want to make sure that when we're spending Albertans' money that Albertans are seeing a return on that, um, both at a provincial and especially at a, at a municipal and local level. So those are uh, those are the pieces that, that we're bringing to the table when we look at this. And, and so we want to make sure that, that, you know, it's not a whole bunch this year and then absolutely nothing the next year because that doesn't put anybody that in It doesn't help at all. No. Right. Because if you, like, you, you talk economic development, economic growth, but like you pointed out, they go hand in hand. If we can't afford to pay for it, we can't grow. Yep. And Rural Alberta has been taking a kicking for the last few years, so I mean, it's been more and more downloaded onto the onto municipalities. Absolutely, and it's it's a trend. I I'd be interested to see how it how it weighs out in the next couple of years. But, uh, well, and again, making making sure that you know that I mean, Doug, you've got my phone number, and uh, you know that availability to have those conversations about how things affect the community, both positive and yeah. negatively. Have those phone calls and and. Uh, you know, I take those concerns and, and also I, I hope, you know, some good news back to Edmonton when we do stuff as well to make sure those things are communicated back to uh, the different ministries that affect us. Well, just speaking for myself, I mean, you are a very open channel and I have spoken to you many times about different things. And I appreciate the, the fact that your your candor, you're willing to s mm -hmm. stop and talk to us. It's not, it's not a closed-door policy like we've seen in the past. Absolutely not. And, you know, all the communities I represent, I've known for 52 years. You know, I remember when they were vibrant in the 70s and 80s, and, mm -hmm. you know, we all struggle with uh, uh, empty storefronts, and, uh, you know, the, the, the labor arrangements have, have, have shifted in our communities. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we look at, at adjusting inside these new realities and continue to see our rural communities grow? I think there's great potential for us to take some pressure off of the cities in, in terms of things like healthcare, 
uh, transportation. Um, I think there's some great opportunities for uh, remote work for people to move out of the cities and enjoy communities like ours. Uh, but we need some infrastructure in place to make that happen and make that a reality and, and allow those people to be successful in those ventures. So. Sounds perfect. <laughs> Policing. Yes. In particular. Funding. Funding. Yes. So uh, I know that there are some discussions going on at, uh, at the provincial level with the, with the Solicitor General around expanding the Alberta Sheriff's Service, uh, looking at how we improve um, policing in rural communities. Um, one of the things that I've taken to Edmonton is, of course, um, an, an ongoing gong about the realities of rural crime uh, throughout the riding. Uh, we have some places that are doing some great pieces, but really what they're doing is they're then moving perpetrators into other areas that aren't quite as prepared to deal with them. Um, so, you know, a unified system, uh, we're looking at better prosecution. Uh, the Solicitor General is committed to more funds in rural Alberta for prosecutors, for judges to be able to deal with uh, issues like repeat offenders. Um, I think the other important element with that is, is um, the work that uh, our Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions is doing in terms of looking at root causes. Uh, again, the idea that we, uh, we put the money and the effort in up front so that we're not paying for the, 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 the symptoms or the results further on down the road, but uh, investing in recovery, investing in uh, long-term treatment programs with, with higher success rates. Um, you know, again, if we reduce crime, we don't need as many police on the road. Right? We don't need as many jails. We don't need those pieces if we're reducing crime up front. So uh, again, I, I think um, one of the things that I see that's, that's really exciting is that our ministries are not working in silos. They're seeing what they're, where there's, there's cooperation. And I think MLAs like myself are part of that solution in terms of speaking to the pieces that, that cross several, uh, several ministers' desks at the same time. There was some talk about um, downloading some of the RCMP funding onto the smaller communities is that like I'm hoping that's got no traction I mean we're already struggling enough with infrastructure here and then they talk about downloading the, some of the costs of the um, rural policing onto the community I, I would certainly be raising that back up to the Minister of Justice if, if it's ever tabled for us absolutely um, I agree completely because you know I, I live here I know we struggle to pay for our roads or infrastructure in, in rural communities Every, everyone outside of Edmonton and Calgary feels the same way. Uh, so again, maybe we need to start looking outside the box in terms of how we facilitate um, law enforcement throughout the province. Mental health and addictions is, that's the root. Right, the root. It, it is, and in, in you know, if we look at we look at at uh, we look at the increase in real crime. Um, majority of the time, they are folks looking for quick dollars to be able to sell pieces that they can then turn in for uh, uh, for access to drugs. Uh, we have a reality in our riding that, that we live right on a, a, a main corridor, mm -hmm. um, so it's an issue for all of our communities along Highway Two. Um, it's lucrative. And so people get involved, and uh, it destroys our, our community. So we, we need to, again, come back and, and find ways to deal with. Uh, and, and again, I think it's fantastic that mental health and addictions are in the same portfolio for the minister because I, there, mm -hmm. there's a huge crossover with that. Um, you know, great opportunity for us, again, in Clarestone in terms of the facilities that are already here for infrastructure and in, in terms of how we can play into um, success in that uh, and these are the kinds of things that I'm speaking for in Edmonton in terms of resources infrastructure that are already available in our rural communities that we can leverage and uh, we can use to model uh, programs and, and results that we could get in other communities both urban and rural so perfect any, any nothing else um, until after the fall election for me. Later on in the agenda, I guess we see that there's maybe an invitation to get the Premier here mm -hmm. for a visitation. Is there anything you need from us to kind of levy that, make that happen? Just so um, our wonderful uh, economic development officer and I have been discussing around the launch of the rural, Northern Rural uh, Refugee Immigration Program. Uh, as far as the opportunity goes, uh, of course, you know, the Premier, while he was uh, in federal government, um, always carried the immigration portfolio with him, regardless of what other portfolios he had. Very passionate about immigration. 
uh, having been a business owner in rural Alberta, um, we know the value of a, of a sustainable labour pool uh, for our communities to grow. Uh, so uh, we are extending invitations to the Premier, to Minister of Economic Development and Tourism, as well as Minister of Immigration and Labour to come and join us when that program launches. Um, again, I think the, the, the model and example that can be set in a community like Clarestone is something that we can look to replicate uh, in multiple communities and ridings throughout Alberta. So I'm excited about the opportunity. Uh, it actually bears a little bit of res resemblance of something I spoke to uh, a previous immigration minister about about five or six years ago in terms of uh, moving new Canadians into areas of the country where they're they're needed mm. uh, to help them get established, to help them assimilate and, and engage with, with their new home and the culture. Uh, I think Claire's Home, through a lot of businesses that have brought in temporary farm workers, has been a great example of how new Canadians integrate and become a, a vibrant part and, and, and uh, significant part of our community. Uh, so we've already set the stage here a little bit. Um, so when we, when we get those dates and those things set, I think a letter from, from the mayor and the council would be much appreciated to help encourage their participation. You let us know. Sure. Yeah, I'd be glad to write a letter. Sure. Well, we had a date, but AUMA got in the way, so we're going to move it to <coughs> to somewhere later in the fall. So, <laughs> which is all right. Yeah. So, anything else, guys? That's the top of your head. I appreciate it. No. No. Well, I sure would like to express my appreciation for you coming, Roger, and. Uh, Putting the time into this, and and uh, we expect great things from you. <laughs> hold, hold me to it. So no that's pressure. why I'm here. So I'm not here to be mediocre. So <coughs> it's a privilege to serve, and and uh, you know I'm I'm so glad that we've got uh, engaged councils like this throughout the riding. Um, I think that uh, we'll see some great things come out of Lady Smith Cloud uh, over the next four years, and uh, you know I'm looking forward to working with you and representing you in Edmonton. And again. Uh, I think almost everyone around the table has my personal self, so <laughs> don't be afraid to use it. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, help me to learn to do my job well so that I can serve you better. So, thank you. All right. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Roger. Thank you for putting the effort in, Roger. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks, Roger. Brad, can you hit the power button on that for me? It's right close to you. Yeah, it's close to you. I think that's it. Just don't blind Doug. I'm going to move it. I'm coming over. Yeah. So, two seconds. Yeah, there goes. Is it firing up? Yeah. yeah you're going to get blinded so. here in a second. There's some blinking going on. Blink. Okay. You may need to just turn it on. Uh, from uh, Peter. Okay, I'm not going to even try that. Yeah. <laughs> Peter C. Cassarello. Cassarello. From South Grove. Uh, welcome. Thank you. And you have a slide presentation for us? Yeah, maybe. PowerPoint? Yep. Okay, I'm going to move. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> The other one. Yeah. 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 Just gonna Thanks, Rob. <coughs> I'm just going to try it Thanks, Mr. Bolt. What's that? Hmm? Let's try not to blind you guys, that's all. <laughs> so, you, can to, you can start talking if you want. I'll take a hammer or two of this one. I missed it. A hammer? <laughs> I'm just, you know, just no, have to drag it sideways? I don't or? know. You can try it, but it wasn't. Oh, there. The one that's supposed to be coming up. I used to have a 48, but somebody needed it. Oh, yeah, it's just sideways. It's, yeah, it's not duplicating. It's uh, really doing two away. screens side by side. Oh, there, there we go. You're smart. Now you can just search. There we go. We're up. We're live. Okay. Thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Peter Casserole, and I'm the Executive Director of the South Grove Regional Initiative, uh, just at our AGM, actually, in Clare's home a few it's months really ago. Good. Thank you very much. We changed our official name, um, or at least our branding name, to South Grove Regional Economic Development. 
uh, just to more clearly communicate who we are and what we do. So uh, I, I can get very long-winded, as some of you know, when I talk about what I do, and I've been told I have 15 minutes. So I'm going to move fast through the broad details so that I can talk specifically about Claire's home and some of the opportunities and challenges facing the town ahead. Um, and this is just my annual report to stakeholders. So we've got 26 members in South Carolina with Claire's home having joined us, and I try to get to 50% every single year, do uh, direct presentations to council. So it's, it's good to be here. Thank you for accommodating me. So South Grove is one of nine regional economic development alliances in the province of Alberta that uh, represent rural communities. Uh, collectively, the nine of us represent over half of the rural communities, over 300 towns, villages, and counties in the province. And uh, the REITAs were started by the provincial government back in 2004 as kind of an experiment in best practice. What happens if all of our towns and counties and villages start to work together on regional projects together? Uh, some of them didn't take. And there was originally something like 16 REITAs uh, way back that they, the government tried to fire up. And the numbers slowly uh, whittled down as different things happened. Eventually, the regions that were around Edmonton and Calgary kind of amalgamated and turned into different organizations. But the nine that have survived represent the densest rural areas in the province and have um, been very, very effective at their mission. We like to boast about our leveraging amount. Uh, so right now, South Grove is leveraging over 30 times the amount that our members and the government of Alberta put in in terms of the value of the projects that we're delivering to uh, the region. And the other benefits that we deliver to the region, as you can probably imagine, are very, very hard to quantify. For example, the, uh, the effort that South Grove and Alberta Southwest and Economic Development Lethbridge have put in over the last 10 to 12 years in renewable energy has been part of the secret sauce that has yielded over a billion dollars of investment in renewable energy in southern Alberta. So it's hard to quantify what our exact portion is, how many jobs are created, but it's regional work that we say enables economic growth and creates opportunities for people like Brady as he's working here in Claire's home. So since 2004, we do a lot of studies. So we've done lots of large-scale studies and reports that give information down to, the, uh, to our communities and kind of give them a nudge and here's a direction you could go in, here's something you need to consider, or provide interesting economic data that helps leverage a new business to start in town or attracts them. Lots of development tools, training sessions for counselors and staff. And over the uh, couple of decades, uh, tens of millions of dollars of external lever uh, dollars, leverage for regional projects and uh, <coughs> investment. And, uh, you know, things like, everybody likes to hang their hats on things like Cavendish, right? Everyone has put their little bit of um, uh, influence into projects like that. And we've certainly done our part for all those. <coughs> so last year, we were incredibly busy. It was my first full year at South Grow. This is just a uh, uh, big old smattering of a list of different things that we had our fingers in. We created a new strategic three-year strategic plan for the organization in the spring of 2018, and I've been busy shoving out uh, the very ambitious first year of that three-year plan, and I think it's just in August that I finally got to take a break and uh, take a, a breath and kind of figure out where we are and start catching up on a few things that had got dropped by the wayside as we pushed projects out. Um, so some of the things that we focus on. I can answer any specific questions about things you've heard about the South Coast is doing. So we uh, have been working on a multi-year project that uh, helps communities get investment ready. Um, I know that Claire's Home is part of the, uh, the town folio project that Alberta Southwest originally does. We've done the same project um, with South Grove before Claire's Home joined us. So all of our towns are equipped with those actual data metrics that uh, their staff can then use to give people the data they need. Uh, we've done BRNEs that uh, we did a big, big BRNE project, business retention and expansion and marketing plans for all the communities of South Grove before Claire's Home came along. And uh, we've done a lot of different uh, research projects in broadband as well. Getting communities ready to uh, chase new investment and equipping them and their staff with what they need to do. Uh, we are working on a long-term foreign direct investment project. A few years ago, we went on a trip to China. Since then, uh, relationships with China have deteriorated. We built a lot of contacts, some good things came out of it, but it's gotten increasingly harder to work with those contacts there. And in the meantime, the Dutch have been knocking, and with our new free trade agreement that we have with Europe, all of a sudden things have gotten very, very easy with working with the folks from Europe, from France and Germany and Belgium. And we are cultivating those relations actively on things like our agri-food file. And we've already seen some of those relationships start to bear fruit. Uh, particularly since we've dived head, head first into the protein industry super cluster, uh, getting behind that horse and pushing because there's a lot of low hanging fruit there, right? 
Um, so we currently have a partnership that's got a four-year ongoing program there to uh, uh, identify investment-ready opportunities in Southern Alberta and market those opportunities both locally to our internal business community and uh, abroad. Uh, Multi-year broadband work. So broadband, of course, it's, it's, it's the new essential utility. It's like having a telephone back in the early 1900s. If your town didn't have telephone access, how could you compete, right? Everyone was going to go down and do business in the next town where they could have those instantaneous uh, communications. So we've spent the last 10 years chasing low-hanging fruit there. Nine towns in South Carolina are full fiber communities. Claire's home's got great um, fiber as well. And now we're trying to work on the rest of those pieces. Uh, w one thing that's been really nice is that the nine towns that have understand that we focused on them for the last 10 years, and now we're trying to help the rest. It makes the whole region stronger. Um, we've got a report that we're in the final stages of editing and going back with our consultants for the villages and towns that don't have fiber, basically saying, here's your options. Pick one, please, and move forward with it, and we'll provide the support you need. And then the other thing that I'm, I have supposed to have my drafts today, they have not arrived on my desk, is a, is a very big ambitious project, which is a cost-benefit analysis for rural broadband. Nobody's done this in Canada yet. Basically saying, what is the economic return to society if we actually, actually invest in the infrastructure needed for very rural broadband for the counties to get the assets we need out there so that um, service providers can do the last mile delivery to farmers, to villages, to hamlets, that sort of thing. And uh, we are hoping that that influence, influences decision making, both for towns and counties, but also for the province and for the feds too. Um, there's a lot that could be done on the broadband piece at the federal level that we have no control over. Policies, for instance, that they could put in place which would really change the game. And uh, we can hope that maybe changes in government or a growing upswell of uh, pushing on those particular files will topple the, what's a, what's, there's no better word for it than uh, the uh, monopoly that the three large uh, incumbents have on the broadband industry right now. Of course, we're pushing agri-food. We focus on the things that we do well, and Southern Alberta has a ton of global opportunity in agri-food as the population of the world goes up, and uh, the wealth of the world also goes up, and they want better food products coming from trusted markets like Canada. And we're also pushing on regional transportation corridors. So South Grove now is the administrative body behind the Highway 3 Twinning Association. We are not lobbyists, but we are providing the support to that organization so that those councillors can do the good work that they're doing. And the ask that they are coming forward with to the uh, provincial government right now is, is uh, we were asked by Rick McIver, the Minister of Transportation, to give him a reasonable, affordable ask so he could get the project started, don't go too big. So in conversations with uh, the folks at Alberta Transportation, they told us, hey, listen, uh, Tabor to Burdett and uh, Medicine Hat to Seven Persons, that's our low-hanging fruit there, and it's ready for engineering. All the, stu the studies have been done, the functional land use planning studies have been done, so why don't you just ask for the engineering, because it's only like $3.2 million or so. So that's the ask that Bill Chapman, the chairperson, is putting in right now. So South Coast is really heavily involved in that project, and Alberta Southwest and all their communities are heavily uh, backing us up on it too. Because we look at Southern Alberta as bisected by two trade corridors, the Highway 2 corridor on which you sit, and the Highway 3 corridor mm -hmm. on which you sit as well. And our goods and services move along those two primary corridors. North-South is doing great. East-West needs to be improved so that we can not be hindered as a region by our transportation access out, like when another large agri-food company wants to come in here and they're going to have to put 7,000 trucks on the road every year and they look at their bottlenecks and think, hey, you know what, maybe we should go up the road to Calgary. Let's put it in Brooks instead of down in southwestern Alberta. Uh, that sort of thing. And finally, of course, we are not stopping with renewable energy. Uh, we've recently had some meetings, our internal group, Alberta Southwest, South Crow, and Economic Development Lethbridge, and said, listen, we don't have to chase utility scale renewable energy anymore. It's arrived. It's uh, competitive with uh, uh, traditional forms of renewable energy, and it's fine without subsidies. It will continue to grow even now that the subsidies have been pulled and removed, and that's, that's great. Less cost to the taxpayer, right? But now that that set, uh, piece has been so successful, we're focusing on community energy generation, promoting <coughs> Um, that to our communities, giving information and support to communities who want to go down that path and explore those policies and those opportunities to lower their own costs over uh, the next few decades. And of course, building up the renewable economy in southern Alberta too. Um, uh, we've got the ribbon cutting for the Lethbridge EV station coming up uh, on Wednesday, actually, August the 14th. And uh, you guys will be having your ribbon cutting for the fast charging EV station here in town in a few months. Yeah.
that's only a few things working on. Here's a list of some of the uh, research projects we've done over the years that inform investments. As you can see at the top, there are two big ones going on right now are the cost-benefit analyses. Um, we're exploring a, a labor market uh, project right now. There's a big federal grant out to do research about uh, local labor markets and workforce adjustment. Um, labor market's changing. The kinds of work that people do is changing. And we need the data that can inform things like program development at Lethbridge College and University of Lethbridge mm -hmm. so that our kids in southern Alberta can go into the right programs. People coming out of uh, industries that are starting to slow down can retrain mm -hmm. and get the skills they need. Uh, this is just an overview of the projects that are in our strategic plan right now. Um, happy to answer any questions you have about any of those there. We're bloody busy. <laughs> um, the grant writing program, uh, I think you mostly have heard about that. You get the newsletters that come out. Well, one thing I didn't talk about here, in November, I've got to have all the invitations out this month, my board says. We're going to be trying to host a big water security forum for Southern Alberta. Tentatively planned for, I think it's November the 12th. Um, we'll probably have it in Lethbridge just because it's central to everything. And the point there is the foundation of economic uh, growth in southern Alberta has and always will be our water. And 100 years ago, uh, our grandparents made some really, really smart decisions and undertook some ambitious projects that built the irrigation districts that have fueled all of the economic growth that southern Alberta has seen. And they kept doing it over the decades, expanding, building new reservoirs, expanding the irrigation canals. In the 90s, with the uh, old man uh, dam fiasco that went down, it seems like everybody lost political will to engage in reservoir development. And when you look 50 years down the road, the water future of southern Alberta looks bleak. Right now, there's enough water. The irrigation um, districts have excess water. We have agreements in place between the municipalities and the districts to move the licenses around. We did that to work back in 2009. But the fact of the matter is, is that we need drug control reservoirs. We need to start working on expanding those now because it's going to take a couple decades to actually get them built. And if we want to get at the head of the game now, we need to do that. So what we're trying to do is pull together a coalition of municipalities and stakeholders, the watersheds, the irrigation districts, um, the educational institutes, and any other stakeholders who want to join us to form a political support block. Basically saying we all agree to these certain principles. Basically, that water is the foundation of our economy. Our grandparents made smart choices. We need to make smart choices today. That means reservoir development. In the most environmentally sustainable and smart, best practices way possible, of course. And be able to put that political support behind a list of priorities developed, hopefully, in, in collaboration with uh, um, the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Infrastructure that are responsible for the, either approving and building these kind of things, so that we can have a list of priorities ready to go that there is in place political support from the communities in the region behind. Of course, that's step one. The devil's in the details. You know, as soon as you start talking brass tacks about where you want to put a reservoir, that's when all the knives come out and people <laughs> lose their tricks. But that's coming down the line. Um, you've probably been talked to death about plant-based proteins. <laughs> so, listen, if, you, if you're talking with anybody from the beef industry, tell them to calm down. Everything is fine. There is more than enough market room for Canada to grow our food exports in beef, in pork, in poultry, in plant-based proteins. And just tell them to have fun with it. Instead of seeing it as a threat to their market, see it as a way they can diversify their own operations so that they can be more secure in a changing world. And the truth of the matter is, is that we're headed for 11 billion people by 2100, all the projections say. The middle class is growing like mad. Most of that growth is happening in countries that have a marginal ability to increase their own domestic food supply. This is a great opportunity for Canada. So it's in all of our best interest to say, you know what, food production, great. Uh, I'm probably way over my time, my apologies. When I go to my communities, I try to look and do an opportunity analysis for the community. Um, I won't waste your time talking about too many of these things because they probably make a lot of sense for you. I wanted to touch on what's been talked about a lot, which is this um, immigration pilot that's happening here in Claire's home. Now, Claire's home's biggest threat, and the challenge that you face, is demographics. It's no secret to you or me or to anybody that it's an old town. You have an old average age, which means you have a small working base that's supporting the rest of the folks that are doing things around here. And you're also sitting at this crossroads where you are ideally positioned midway between large service centers, which means you have the potential to be a regional service center yourself which means that when folks are looking to have highway access north to Calgary to avoid the costs that are further north and avoid the costs that are further south and take advantage 
of being in the agricultural heartland. You've got advantages there, which Brady has uh, obviously told you about. He's, mm -hmm. His phone's ringing off the hook. People are very interested in setting up shop in Clairestone, but they need labor. And this immigration partnership has a potential to help you fix that labor problem. But there's a whole bunch of different pieces here that are really, really complicated to put together. Business wants to come to town, but they're not going to come to town if they can't find the labor. They're not all medical cannabis uh, facilities that people just want to move because they're so excited to work there. You know, if it's a, it's a lettuce pro processing factory, it doesn't have the same sex appeal that medical cannabis does, and there's not going to be a ton of people who want to move to Clareson to work there. So you need to find a way to provide the labor. But in order to get the labor attracted to the town, you need the jobs. The jobs chicken and egg problem. In order to get the labor to the town, especially if it's manual labor, you need housing as well. So you got to crack the affordable housing issue at the same time. So there's complicated pieces that all have to be put together at the same time. And as uh, the MLA was saying, if we want to make this pilot work so that it can be replicated and rolled out across the province of Alberta, it's got to be done right. And my boy Brady is a very, very talented guy. He's one of the most talented ec devs that I've met in Southern Alberta. That's a lot of work. I started out of grad school working in immigration, doing frontline services with refugees coming from other countries. It takes a lot of effort to help integrate them into Canada. We are a very different country than many of the places that refugees and immigrants are currently coming from around the world. And if that kind of thing is all on his shoulders, it's going to, something's gotta break. He's gonna gotta drop the ball one way or another, and that's no fault of his. It's a lot of work. And this particular project is a massive job. So my encouragement to you is if you can work with Brady to try to um, you know, get some help from our friends up in uh, Edmonton to get the support you need to get more resources, more human resources in place for the next couple of years, even if it's only a temporary basis, to make sure that this project really gets knocked out of the park. Somebody who's got the right expertise to support Brady in that role. There's grants out there. It does not have to be town money. There's a lot of people who want to see this succeed. WV wants to see it succeed. The feds at immigration want to see it succeed. Our friends in Edmonton want to see it succeed. If you can create, leverage the, the buzz and excitement around it to get the dollars in place for the support, that would be fantastic. That's my advice. Um, just having dabbled in these kind of things before and knowing how busy this job can be and how busy Brady's job is as well. Yeah. Happy to answer any questions you might have about any of those <coughs> ideas there as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. We need That's to support Brady in this immigration pile. Oh, very important. Oh, yeah. That one. That one. That one. Yeah. Thanks for your time. <laughs> You guys have been busy. That's a lot of oh stuff you guys have taken on. It's awesome. It's fun. It's, it's a fun. very fun job. Every busy. day is different. It's very busy. It opens up a lot of doors. It does. I mean, it's, uh, we did have a presentation for the grant writing department that you guys run. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's very impressive. That, that was really good. Yeah. Yeah, was well, really just good. being part of the AGM when you guys hosted it here was opens yeah. your eyes and yeah, holy cow. Really the networking helpful. and the resources that are available within that South Field is yeah. it's a great door there. Yeah. I'm glad we joined. No, we we're yeah. looking forward to big things. I think, I, I mean, and that immigration, being the pilot project in Alberta, I mean, that's definitely going to help us. Mm -hmm. As long sure. as we handle, like you say, handle it correctly. And that's where we'll be leaning on our MLA to look for some financial support to, to get the right administration for it. It's, it's not a one-man job. It's a complicated puzzle piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> There's multiple chicken and eggs in that particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. But Appreciate it. Appreciate yeah. your candor. No. Well, well, I'd like to thank you for coming, Peter. And mm -hmm. Any other questions so before Good we uh, say goodbye? <laughs> no? Okay. Thanks, Peter. Oh. Oh.
Okay. That was very interesting. Okay, we'll move into our action items. Bylaw 1662, the Fire Services Bylaw, first reading. Marion. So, administration, uh, we've been working on updating bylaws and policies, as Council's aware. So, one of the bylaws I've been reviewing is the Fire Services Bylaw. And uh, before you tonight is two bylaws. We've actually broken into two sections. One is the the uh, fire services, which basically establishes the department and how the department functions. And then the fire protection, which is the rules around fire bans and burning and those kind of things. So we broke it into those two. Um, this has been reviewed by the Emergency Services Committee and is being recommended both of these bylaws have first reading. I will point out a couple of changes that are in here. Um, one in the fire services bylaw is the filling of a vacancy for fire chief. So because we've moved that back to a full-time position, um, we've amended that from being basically a recommendation of the fire department to section 7.1 says when a vacancy for fire chief occurs, a hiring committee consisting of the CAO, human resources, and an officer from the fire department will select the candidate. So using a more formalized hiring process for that. And then as well, uh, another change was the power of members. The previous bylaw had all members of the fire department being designated officers under the uh, Municipal Government Act. And we've amended that to the fire chief is a designated officer. So that gives him certain powers within um, the fire code and the fire act, fire safety act. So those are the two main changes other than um, separating those two bylaws into, from one into two. Okay. Okay, bylaw 1662, would anybody be willing to put the first reading? I'll make it. Councilor Schultz, question? Moved by Councillor Schultz, give bylaw number 1662, the fire services bylaw, first reading. All in favor? Carried. Bylaw 1663, the fire protection bylaw, first reading. Mike? <coughs> Question. Moved by Councillor Cutler to give bylaw number 1663, the fire protection bylaw, first reading. All in favor? Carried. Next up is bylaw 1673, the Water and Sewer Utility Bylaw Amendment, second and third reading. Marion. So this bylaw was presented for first reading at the <coughs> July 15th council meeting. Um, it is a change to the bulk water station um, to the rates that we're currently charging the MD in our water services agreement. And then as well, um, authorizing the utility payment plan, so for pre-authorized debits, um, seeing as we've increased those costs in the water and sewer utility, um, we're providing an option for residents to be able to pay monthly rather without penalty. Without penalty. Similar to what we do with the tax incentive program. So it's before you tonight for second and third reading. <coughs> Any questions? No questions. I'll give bylaw 1673 a second reading. Question? Moved by Councillor Zimmer to give bylaw number 1673, the water and sewer utility bylaw amendment, second reading. All in favor? Carry. And for third reading. <coughs> I'll do third reading, please. Question? Moved by Councillor. Carlson to get bylaw number 1673, the water and sewer utility bylaw amendment, third and final reading. All in favor? Carried. <coughs> number four, notice of petition. Now, as you all know, um, there's a petition been presented to Marion. Uh, we've got a few options when we hear the outcome of the petition. Um, I would suggest 
my own personal feeling on this is rather than waiting for the results of the petition from uh, the presentation Marion will do is that we go ahead and uh, do a plebiscite and put the question to the town and clear this off once and for all and I'd like some conversation on this I agree we need to clear the air get get this settled once and for all I mean putting it into the people's choices giving them the opportunity to have their voice and their speech I just see nothing wrong with it okay. well and one thing is we'll put out the information there's been too much misinformation out there mis misguided uh, information and half truths and, and this will clear it up yep. so I, I if you guys are okay with that any other comments? I'm curious about the the timeline of having a plebiscite the cost of a plebiscite and I guess my own opinion is I think we've the community has spoken and said you know we need these other services and I appreciate there's some maybe some misunderstandings out there but my opinion is it's been declared we've had open houses we've given lots of opportunity I think it's time to move forward I would agree with you there's been uh, the support is there in the community and that's why I'm not I believe it should go to the plebiscite just to clear up because there's with all the information that's been in the paper lately from different residents and and the information is not based on a lot of it on fact it'd be I think this is a good way to clear the air wow. we put we make out we we have an open house we get the facts out there <laughs> One I of the things is, is <coughs> I'm just saying, when we go into build, if we go into, if it's decided to move that, it goes in with a positive aspect instead of a bunch of gray uncertainty. This is what the people wanted. I think that giving them the facts and moving forward in a positive way with everybody's support, I think would be beneficial for the, for the town itself. We've been in a position where we've said that we want to focus on economic development. We want to see the town grow. We want a, uh, a Claire's home that is a positive place to move, a positive place to grow a business. Mm -hmm. In doing so, mm -hmm. this council has worked very hard to ensure that we've got those services in place, that we've got a daycare that people want to be in. We've got a play school that is uh, attractive to somebody that's coming in from out of town. And we've able, got, able for growth. And we've got space so. that we can grow those facilities. Um, to be in a position where somebody professional or blue collar come, comes into town and goes, I'd like to move in here, but the facilities don't match what I would want for my children, even from an exterior point of view. Um, my kids have used the facilities. We went through through uh, preschool. We went through daycare. Um, the most amazing care and the most amazing people work in those facilities. Um, what there were, what the limitations that they're working with within the buildings, and what the issues they face trying to maintain their licensing, their, their licensing. It's huge. Um, is, is huge. We need to get these things taken care of and we need room to grow. I have absolutely no problem putting it to a plebiscite and realizing that within our community we, uh, we want to see that growth and anybody that uh, has issues with that, has issues with our community growing in the next 25 years so let's stop worrying about what we're what we're doing within the next 16 months and let's start worrying about where our community is going to be in the next 25 years um, I am I, I would like to move if there's no further discussion to push it through to a plebiscite and uh, make a motion to to uh, proceed with that well, we'll take any more discussion before we Put that motion forward. Very well said. I, I can say that any well better. Said. I yeah. agree with it. It's 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 important that we. I mean, that, the daycare is Pincher Creek. Anybody that wants a lesson to go talk to Pincher Creek. They didn't believe their daycare was that important. They allowed it to fall to pieces and close. They began to lose businesses. They began to lose employees. 
the town started to uh, get into real trouble. The town now, at their own expense, is building a daycare and uh, just to get everything back on track. And they had a good economic growth going. But they turned, by, by not proceeding with something like this, they turned it all around and almost lost everything. Right. So it's a good example for us. But uh, I personally think I'd like to see, I'd like to see the air clear, put it out there, stop all the half-truths, and uh, get the public's opinion on it. Agreed. So any other s discussion? Then I'll, I'd like to refer to Mr. Carlson's motion. Oh, Marion, you want to say something? If I could just speak to what that, uh, what the requirements of that would be, because <coughs> I have looked at dates Thank for you. that. Thank okay. um, you. So the um, vote on the bylaw must be a date that's fixed by resolution of council. So um, looking at the time it takes to notify the public to pass the question to get the ballots printed, those kind of things. Um, I'm suggesting that perhaps we look at a date of September 30th, Monday, September 30th, <coughs> and uh, the election needs to fall under the Local Authorities Election Act, and so all of those procedures would remain the same, so the vote would follow those same procedures. So there's a number of resolutions that would be required, but the first would be to set that date. So if that's the resolution that Councillor Carlson is putting forward, we do have a draft resolution prepared. Councillor Carlson, are you okay with that date? That added to your... Yep, that would be wonderful. I, we don't have to amend it because we haven't recognized and it. How would that question read? You can read it if you're ready for me to No, read. I can't read it till we... Yeah. So the <coughs> the draft resolution we have is to hold a vote of the electors on the question of bylaw 1674, a borrowing bylaw, on Monday, September 30th, 2019, from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., with the polling station being at the Clarestone Community Center, located at 5928th Street West. Yes. Yes. Any other discussion before I call for the question? I just one note um, on the 29th we have culture days in the community center um, are we able to set up for the vote in the morning of the 30th or yeah. Yeah, we'll, be, we'll be in the uh, large hall oh, oh. small hall yeah. no, we'll be the large one But yes, we would be able to come in early in the morning and set up. Set it up. doesn't take long to set up. No, not for, not for an election. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I'm going to ask for the question. <laughs> it's okay. Moved by Councillor Carlson to hold a vote of the electors on the question of bylaw number 1674, a borrowing bylaw, on Monday, September 30th, 2019, from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., with the polling station being at the Clareson Community Center, located at 59208 Street West. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, we will, uh, Mary? There's just <coughs> some further motions, if we can yeah, uh, have that. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the next would be, is council prepared to do an advanced poll like we do with an election? We have to follow um, the... And we have looked at those dates and are suggesting that Thursday, September 26th would work as an advanced, advanced poll. Day. We will be at AUMA that day, but um, Blair and Kareen can manage the polling station. And we're <coughs> suggesting from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m., which is the same hours we had for the advanced poll of our election. And as for funding this uh, by-election, do we have to uh, make a motion to withdraw money from General. to cover it? It won't, it's out of budget. Yeah, it'll be an out of budget expenditure. Yeah. Do we need to do that right now, or? Um, let's set these dates, and then we'll we'll add that resolution if Kay. we could. All right. I don't think that we have because you've stated that we're going to hold the election. I don't think we need a further motion to that because it is by way of um, motion already. So yep. I think we're okay. 
Okay, the first one is for the advance poll. Somebody make that motion. Councillor Schlossberger. Question. Moved by Councillor Schlossberger to hold the advance <coughs> vote for the vote of the electors on Thursday, September 26, 2019, from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Clarkson Community Center, located at 5920 8th Street West. All in favor? Carried. Next one was the um, institutional vote. If somebody would like to. Councillor Cutler. Question. Moved by Councillor Cutler to hold an institutional vote for the vote of the electors on Monday, September 30th, 2019, at the Clareson General Hospital, Willow Creek Continuing Care Center, Porcupine Hills Lodge, Cottonwood Village, Heritage Manor, and Parkside Manor. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Was there one more or is that it? We two just more. need to appoint the returning officer. Um, and oh, well, I thought that was Kareen be the returning officer again. Okay. I'll make that motion to appoint Kareen as the returning officer. Councillor Zimmer, question? Moved by Councillor Zimmer to appoint Kareen Keyes as chief returning officer and Marion Carlson and Blair Bullock as substitute chief returning officers for the vote of the electors. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. <clears throat> and the last question is what? Um, so one of the requirements is that the uh, question that is to be on the ballot needs to be by resolution of the council. And so I have crafted um, a proposed question, and I'll read it to you. Are you in favor of the Town of Clarison Council passing bylaw number 1674 to authorize Council to incur indebtedness in the amount of $2,800,000 for the purpose of constructing a town-owned building to create facilities for administration, daycare, play school, and other users, and community space referred to as the multi-use community buildings? Any questions on that? Sounds good. Okay, motion please. Councillor Carlson. Question. Moved by Councillor Carlson that the following question be on the ballot for the vote of the electors on bylaw number 1674 of borrowing bylaw. Are you in favor of the town of Clarestone Council passing bylaw number 1674 to authorize council to incur indebtedness in the amount of $2,800,000 for the purpose of constructing a town-owned building to create facilities for administration, daycare, play school, and other users, and community space, which referred to as the multi-use community buildings. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, we're moving on. Number five, bylaw 1674, the borrowing bylaw. This is the motion, uh, this uh, bylaw will have to be tabled. Yeah. Um, do you want me to do my declaration on the sufficiency of the petition at this point in time? Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. So as council is aware, um, I received a petition on August 7th, 2019, and I have done the work to uh, determine the sufficiency. So I will read that declaration to you. I, Marion Carlson, Chief Administrative Officer of the Town of Clarisome in the Province of Alberta, do solemnly declare that the petition received August 7, 2019, pursuant to the provisions of Section 231.1 of the Municipal Government Act, petitioning the Council of the Town of Clarisome to bring Bylaw 1674, a borrowing bylaw, for the purpose of constructing a town owned building to create facilities for administration, daycare, play school, and other users and community space, referred to as the multi-use community buildings, to a vote by the electorate is sufficient. Mm -hmm. the, reconciliation, sufficient. the reconciliation of the uh, petition is we, re we required a minimum of 10% of the population. The 2016 statistics uh, our population was 3,780, so that means we needed a minimum of 378 electors to sign the petition. Uh, there were 485 signatures on the petition. 
five were excluded, uh, four for either uh, incomplete or non-existent street address or legal description, and one for um, the absence of a witness signature, which left 480 valid uh, signatures. One thing to note is that I did not compare the signatures for the electors to the voters list. If there was a civic address or a legal description that was within the town of Clarison, that was declared as, as being an elector. Doesn't matter. That's good. Thanks for your work, Marion. Yep. Thanks very much. <laughs> Wow. Mm -hmm. That was that was recorded too, eh? That was recorded. She just, just she just, just admitted to that. She just yeah. Fantastic. Amazing. Wow. Amazing person. Okay, we're moving on. So Where were we? So yes. <laughs> so now the borrowing bylaw will be tabled until yeah. after the vote of yeah. the electors. Do we need a motion to table that? Or can we just leave? You just it? don't proceed with your okay. second and third. Number six, we'll move on. Thank you for coming. Thank you guys. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks, guys. That was your wish to get out there. Is that one? <coughs> okay, we'll just wait for the, everybody to. <laughs> Don't wait. He was so good. You guys, so good. Thank you. Good job, Thank you. Good job, Thank you. Good Thank you. Oh God, <laughs> okay, where were we now? His worship. <laughs> she actually said that. Mm -hmm. Out loud. Mm. Okay, sorry. We digress. Number six, correspondence. The Honorable Leela Sharon Ahir, Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism, and status of women. Uh, this is for the 2019 Stars of Alberta Volunteer Awards. Um, basically, take this for information for now. Yeah, the deadline for nominations is September 20th. So, if there's any, uh, there's six award categories, or six, sorry, six awards, two in each category, so three categories. So, if you think of anyone who's uh, would be a good recipient in our community, by all means, I encourage people to do the nomination. Okay. Number seven, correspondence, Alberta Labor and Immigration, uh, Rural and Northern Immigration Pilot. It's a letter from the Honorable K.C. Madhu, Min Minister of Municipal Affairs. No. No, Sean McLeod. Sean McLeod. Oh, right. Deputy Minister. I'm one behind here. I didn't flip the page, sorry. Sean McLeod, Deputy Minister. This is again just information at this stage. <coughs> just congratulating the town on our successful ap application to Canada's Rural and Northern Immigration Fund. Mm -hmm. And we do have support for this program. Very much so. Mm -hmm. We met with them at EDC. We have lots of support. Good. Mm. You're talking provincial support? Yeah. Good. All of the stakeholders. All of them, actually. Yeah. Federal, too. Federal, too? Yeah. Mm. Well, that's great. It's going to be good. It'd be interesting to see how it works out. Okay, number eight Alberta Environment and Parks. Status of application Alberta Community Resilience Program. Marion. Yes, in our 2019 budget, we had um, an application for funding from the Alberta Community Resilience Program for Phase 3, I guess it would be, of our uh, stormwater infrastructure project. The total project was $1.5 million with $1.362 and change coming, uh, proposed to come from the uh, Community Resilience Program. Due to the amount of applications, um, our program was not approved. It was deemed eligible, but we were unable to receive funding. So mm -hmm. um, what we have done actually is we've met with uh, Associated Engineering, who is the engineer on that project, 
and uh, we we set up a meeting with the program coordinator and have met with her and talked about maybe where our application could be stronger and uh, we're preparing a further application to be submitted prior to the September 30th deadline this year. So Perfect. it's in the works already. Okay. Well done. Ooh. Great. Crazy Tom. Number nine, correspondence, Alberta Municipal Affairs, potential meeting with Minister AUMA Convention. Again, meeting with this minister would be wonderful, but we have no outstanding questions for that department. And, and without substantial, you know, without yeah. right. gotta have something. You gotta, having yeah, something to go something. there for, mm -hmm. we're Not wasting his chat. time. Right. And our own. Yeah. So it's, it's, we'd just be going there for a conversation. So I, I if, if it's okay with you guys, I'd just leave that alone. Right. Take it for information. Need, could use it. Yeah. Needs it, yeah. Okay. Number 10, correspondence, Mr. Roger Reed, MLA, Livingston McLeod. Invitation to a community conversation, August 20th. And this is with the Minister of Agriculture will be there. And this is on the... Um, 20th. The 20th? Yeah, 20th. Tuesday, August 20th. Yeah. For From 10 a.m. to noon. It's a, a unique time. It's and it will be know. in town, so if anybody has the time, I personally won't be in town. I'll be on the coast, but I will attend. You'll attend. Anybody that can I should. Plan but is, is it a symposium? Is it going to be? I couldn't be there until <coughs> ten thirty. I mean, it, it it doesn't directly affect us, but it does affect us. It's, it's the Farm Freedom and Safety Act. Mm -hmm. Just pass and it, it off to agriculture about. friends. Let them know that they'll be there. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of scary. They know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it took a long time for for safety to be put into agriculture, mm -hmm. and my fear with this is that safety can be taken back out. Because I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I know quite a few we, people personally that have got injured on farms and are long, off on long term, mm -hmm. no support. They qualify for nothing. Mm -hmm. I think you'll it's find now be. that that there are a lot of people that now that they've seen the program are in favor of it and just want clarifications. And yeah. Slight modifications. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah, the main thing about it is protection for workers, and it was. I didn't agree with a lot of it, but it did put protection for workers in there. Yeah, and, and my own son being a rancher, I'm well aware of the challenges they face, but it's, it's the employees that face the challenges. So, if anybody's uh, free, Roger will be there. Okay, we'll take it for information. News released, Alberta Health Services Review, Minister Chandro. Anything, take it for information, anything you want to discuss on this? No. No. Number 12, Correspondence, Town of Peace River. Now this is uh, a little more startling and uh, Marion has a, something to say about this one, the GST. Yes, so the Town of Peace River recently had a, a GST audit by CRA, and they are requiring them to pay GST on their intermunicipal cost sharing agreements. And so, in their case, they have one um, that was an $8 million contribution to a recreation facility or whatever it was. And um, so, they're, they've given them an order to pay GST on that. So they're concerned about what that implication might have with the, with the ICFs and all of those intermunicipal collaboration agreements that, that all municipalities have. Um, they did give a couple of examples in their backgrounder of you know, a, a transfer of $3,000 for a fireworks display, um, you know, those kind of things. It makes sense if it is a service being provided that you're contracting a service that you would pay GST on that. But if it's simply an intermunicipal transfer, it there's some concern. Mm -hmm. So they're asking for municipalities throughout Alberta to support that. Um, I understand that they are bringing an emergency resolution forward at the AUMA convention, mm -hmm. so I think that's an opportunity mm -hmm. where we can put our voice behind uh, mm -hmm. support of this initiative. Okay. 
they are appealing the decision and that's what they're looking for the support. Well, and that's, that could affect like even mm -hmm. our transfer payments from the MD for the library mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for recreation. That's what I mean. They're all suddenly taxable 5%. Yeah. It's a 5% reduction in our revenue is what it is. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, and it's nice that Roger's sitting yeah. there listening to this because yeah. it's something that we can. But this was something they found in the he will like, take forward. just recent past, or was it just something just happened? Like they're not going back years. Uh, I understand it was just their last. Last one. one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But it sets a precedent that really, mm. because the province is mandating that we all get these well, agreements in place. An already kind of hostile, fragile environment is now going to be a little bit more hostile and fragile. It's going to be more. Wow, we got PTSD yeah. on this. And it's the it's the towns that are going to be affected yeah. because the MDs are are doing the transfers, so the the GST becomes payable by like for us anything that Willow Creek puts into mm -hmm. we're on the hook for the GST. Well, we yeah. would we would charge them GST on any transfers they'd be sending. Us. If they would pay the GST, but they might just say no. This is our transfer. It's on you. Reverse it out. Yeah. yeah. It's not as easy as just selling the Or MD. vice versa, if we're supplying a service to them, yeah. right. or transfer to them for any reason. Yeah, it's not right. as easy as just saying, well, right. you're going to pay GST on it. No, I'm not. No. <laughs> I, I was quite the read. I was like, Whoa. So it's something that, um, Roger, I, I can ask Gally a question that, as mayor. Uh, are you aware of this? No, first time I've heard of it. Can we forward this information on to you so you Please can? Please do and CC John Barlow as well. Okay, we will move on. Number 13, correspondence. Forest invitation grand opening of the new operational office here in town. Mm -hmm. And it is October, October 2nd. 2nd. Yeah, it hasn't been formalized yet, but she just wanted to get it on your calendars for October 2nd from 11 to 1. And then I'll get the details into September, so. I'll make sure I attend that. Just, you'll you have to let it? me know the, the permit out. Yeah. yeah, when I have that, I'll forward that out to council okay. members. Thank you. All right, we'll move on. Number 14, request for decision, the shingle sign policy. Very. Right. That's a great idea. Yeah, so this is a policy that has come from, there's been some discussion uh, about the downtown revitalization and the signage program, directional signage, that kind of thing. So. Basically, a shingle sign is a, is a blade sign that hangs out from the building, um, and um, it, it, I guess, identifies what types of services that business might offer, rather than the business name is how it's proposed in this policy. Um, it is included in the land use bylaw, but this policy was actually drafted for that downtown revitalization. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind it is that the, there would be some consistency in what that sign looked like. Um, it would be uh, painted black with uh, rust-proof paint, and they would have the, uh, the choice of a black, white, or brush metal colors for the word cutout with a contrasting color behind within the manufacturer's capabilities. And the signs would all be double-sided. Um, in order for us to keep some consistency, uh, the Economic Development Department would facilitate the manufacturing of the sign, and then waive the. We're recommending that we waive the permit fee of fifty dollars uh, plus a dollar per thousand dollars of project value, because we feel that this would uh, increase the participation from the businesses right. in the program. Uh, we did approach four <coughs> locations for quotes. Two were in Clarestone, one in the MD of Willow Creek, and one in Monarch. Uh, the one out of Monarch was the most cost effective with a sign cost of $250. Now that cost would be passed on to the business, but we would facilitate that. Uh, the two local quotes we got were more than double that price, so Ooh, we're yeah. recommending that, that <coughs> Monarch is the one that we go with. and. Um, um, I guess the other thing is uh, we need a motion of council in order to be able to waive the permit fee. So uh, by there's a couple of policy or recommended uh, resolutions here. One is to adopt the policy. One is to waive the fee. 
One other thing to bring to your attention is that the MPC or the Municipal Planning Commission is aware of this request from these business owners. Uh, we've had four to five of them. So they're on board, the local it business owners? Are interested. Board. Now, once they know what the program looks like, then we'll firm, firm that okay. up. There's been interest shown cool. by about four or five businesses. Um, but because of the timing here, uh, MPC has not reviewed this policy, but it does align with the land use bylaw as it currently exists. We will be doing some revisions to that land use bylaw, uh, like our annual review with Old Man River, um, where we can maybe tighten some things up there if we need to or clarify some things. Um, but right now they're busy with these intermunicipal development plans and some other projects they're working on, so it may be a while before we review the land use bylaw. But the policy currently aligns with it. So <clears throat> there's been a couple of businesses that have been intrigued about these signages, mm -hmm. but has it been taken back to them that we're going to tell them what sign they can have? Yeah, the design will be there and the materials because you want some consistency so that you've got that street appeal. They'll have some options within it. And I know this has been reviewed by the Economic Development Committee as well and, and is coming I think it's great for the aesthetics yeah. of downtown. It We're having a, really a, a mock-up made <laughs> so we know exactly what we're yeah. getting okay. for our money. So, and it's gonna, they're all going to be standard. Mm -hmm. we, we just can't have... Haphazard. It'll look shitty. Right? Yeah, if you look at the, the backgrounder that's in here, you'll see, you know, how... But that's 50 stores in one little mini... Like, we have fairly yeah. spaced out stores down. That's why I was kind of... To me, it's like... I like the way it looks, but I'm just worried that if we say, yes, you can do this, but you have to do it our way. Like, only this sign, I just wonder if that would hinder some I think there's some been some discussion. <laughs> Good. Oh, okay. That's, yeah. that's So, ba basically, it's the the theme of right. being the same. So, it's, <clears throat> it's gifts. It's... Right. It's the the side oh. cutouts can be modified to reflect gotcha. their business and so right. on and so forth. So they can personalize it, but just yeah. not so there. So for two hundred and fifty bucks, your business can have a sign that represents the other ones and makes See. look like a community mm -hmm. that you want to draw. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's where that. I got an issue. I don't want four stores doing it and the rest not either. Everybody's on and makes it look good, or nobody's on and leave it as it is. It eventually, it. I think yeah. 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 I think if you get them started, yeah. They'll see the. I hear you, but once they yeah. see the aesthetics of it, you'll get the other ones on board slowly. It's not going to be an overnight everybody, but I think That's if right. you and start you have it, to and they'll see the improvement. And We've done this before years ago, and there was uh, a couple of stores put out the mm -hmm. shingle signs, mm -hmm. and then you saw other stores, and there was three or four more, and then kind of got away from it. Kind of got away from us, yeah. And I think that might stopped. be where people might kick back, right? Is that this has sort of been presented once before, but you didn't get buy-in. Maybe with having it with the continuity. Well, back then, the economic, the, the push behind it from, from the business community, stopped, mm -hmm. and then of course the businesses just kind of let it drop right. because they, they couldn't there was nowhere to go and right. get this. No for it. This no, has no. got a uniform oh, uniformity yeah. about it because it's mm -hmm. got it's got the supplier, mm -hmm. you can order them. It's got the costs up front. I think that, I think we should I think it's a great opportunity to see if mm -hmm. it works. It's oh. worked in other communities. This this mm -hmm. type of signage works. Oh yeah, no, I think it's great. People are very yeah, charmed think, by I that. Say, I, think, I think I'm not saying they don't look. I think they look great. It's just I don't want to look down the street and have it look like a hockey smile, right? Yeah. You got the sign. Oh, this, you sign know what? If you only see four down the street, yeah, those I, are the four businesses that'll be like hockey smiles. Well, <laughs> and one of the analogies that yeah. was given was was to the effect of the the neighbor across the street puts in an, a nice new flower bed in the front yard, and then all of a sudden the guy across the street. Uh, does something with exactly. his fence and so on and so on and so on and all of a sudden the, yeah. yeah and it'll be a nice flow with that our community sign that we have and it says community events with the rod iron on it yeah. and then like you said this is a program that's we're offering it's it's kind of town initiated program it's not like you well, don't that's, have to that's not how i read it and that's thanks for the clarity okay okay so is anybody interested in making the first motion councillor sosper Question. Moved by Councillor Schlossberger to adopt policy number 5.6.09, the shingle sign program policy as presented, effective August 12, 2019. 
All in favor? Opposed? Carried. And the second one, the permit fee waiver. But you were oh, tied, so try oh, again. You just got sit. Paper scissors. <laughs> Councillor Moore. Question. Move by Councillor Moore to waive permit fees when participating in the shingle sign program as per policy 5.6.09, the shingle sign program policy. All in favor? Opposed? <coughs> Carried. Okay, we're moving on. Financial report. Any questions? Nope. Motion to accept it. I'll make a motion to accept the income statement for July 31st as presented. Question? Move by Councillor Zimmer to accept the consolidated statement of operations for the month ended July 31st, 2019 as presented. All in favor? Carried. Information brief. The MDA will accrete circulation. Marion. So we've been <coughs> circulated on a application for development from the MDA Lower Creek for the operation and construction of a commercial cannabis cultivation facility out at the airport. The facility will have 18 individual facilities within three separate buildings. The deadline for comments is August 16th and administration has reviewed the application and we didn't identify any concerns. Um, if council does have any comments, we could forward those to the MD prior to the deadline. All good? I got none. I think it's great. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll move on. Information. Oh, wait a minute. There was something else in here, was there not? Was it all cannabis? No. Oh. Okay, we'll move on. Information brief. 2019 AUME, AUMA Convention Resolutions. That's just information. Mm -hmm. You can look it up uh, yourself. Mayor, I just have one comment on okay. that as well. Um, so the Town of Manton, as you're aware, asked for a seconder <coughs> on their resolution, and we provided some feedback to them. They have revised their resolution, and it is included in this resolution list without a seconder. But I just wanted Council to be aware of that because they received the same feedback from AUMA as they got from us. And so they they have revised their resolution. So you'll see that at the, at the convention. At the convention. To, to okay. And they went without a seconder. Yeah. yeah. So I thought it could, they couldn't be accepted without a seconder. Well, I think they're trying... There will have to be a seconder at convention. At convention to, yeah. to allow it to Yeah, there the always floor. has had to be a seconder at convention, but they're trying to get seconders Before as it part goes of the, the resolution up. package ahead of time to make sure it's been vetted properly. That's the part I missed about the Willow Creek that I was looking for was there was, a, there was two applications there. The other was for a residential house, but again, there's no concern, right? You, you read that. In the... In the MD? In the MD one? Yeah. Yeah, were, were they replacing Cameron the house? Cameron and Conchie, yeah. uh, Connie Fancy's Fancy's place. Place. Yeah. taking down the rebuilding. Yeah. yeah, it was the second yeah. part of that. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's down further. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's down further. That wasn't as part of this. Oh, was, oh they, were, I, no. they were all it put together. It wasn't part of that circular. <laughs> they were all put together, so I thought, no, I didn't know that. Okay. Number 18, contract settlement. Information brief, any questions on that? Good. Well, I'm glad it's done, but. Good on you guys. It's done. It's done. We're yeah. glad it's done. Of it. done, done. Really glad. <laughs> Nothing else. Uh, 18. Number 19, information brief. Invitation to. Oh, we talked about this. This is the informa uh, inviting the Premier to our conference here. Hmm. For the launch, information brief, CAO report. That's information. Information brief, council resolution status. Again, that's information. And adoption of information items. Any questions on the information items? A 
I sure appreciate the reports. Hey. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's so insight. interesting what, what you guys are doing all the time. It's really, wow, 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 wow. Wow, wow. We're going to make a motion for the information briefing, right? Minutes. You can. I was going to. I thought we went past that. I was going to go back and so like, make a motion to accept the information brief as presented. Also, who's ever made that motion? <laughs> Question? Moved by Councillor Zimmer to adopt the information items as presented. All in favor? Sure. A motion to go in camera, Thanks. please. Thanks, all. Councillor Cutler. Make these reports. All, the, all in favor going in camera. We are in camera. Take a break. We have a 10 minute break. <coughs> okay. Who would like to make the first motion? For I'll make the motion to come out of in camera. <laughs> I'll make motion to come out of in camera. Don't worry. All in favor coming out of in camera? Ah, we're out of in camera. Okay, who would like to make the first motion concerning the legal fees for the library? Councillor Moore? That's a second motion. Oh, geez, it was. <coughs> okay. Encroachment. Encroachment. Who would like to make a motion for the encroachment? Councillor Cutler. Nobody else, please. Question. Moved by Councillor Cutler to enter into an encroachment agreement with Richard and Bonnie Downey for the lane encroachment located at 255 52nd Avenue East, Block 14, Block 123, Fund 2496R. All in favor? Carried. Second motion. Councillor Moore. Question. Moved by Councillor Moore to approve the out of budget expenditure for legal fees for the Clarestown Public Library to a maximum amount of $15,000. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Carlson, you're making a motion to adjourn, I understand. Perfect. We are adjourned. Camera off, please. <laughs>